civic life. Uh, and I think it's important to underscore the word irrational because there is a rational fear of Muslims. There are certainly real threats that involve uh, terrorist actors, people who want to commit violence, doing so in the name of Islam, unfortunately. We've seen some of those instances play out in Times Square, uh, Fort Hood, and a few other places. Uh, but what we're talking about is those people who are engaging in an irrational fear of Islam, trying to take what are real threats and blow them up into myths. Uh, and doing so, they, I think, have a variety of motives. These are uh, generally right-wing actors who are propagating certain myths about Islamic participation in the United States for sometimes political reasons, sometimes financial reasons, to make a buck off of it. Sometimes it's just to push a right-wing agenda, a political and policy agenda. Sometimes it's sim simply for lack of knowledge. Uh, and we see that a lot on certain Fox News broadcasts. Uh, and so these myths, I think, are the things that we concern us the most. Uh, and I wanted to start with maybe a couple of examples, because that would help. Glenn Beck, uh, you guys know him on Fox News. He said recently, uh, quote, what is the number of Islamic terrorists? 1%? I think it's closer to 10%. And that's the kind of irrational driven fear because when you play that out, there's 1.5 billion Muslims in the world, 10% of that would be 100 and, or 150 million Islamic terrorists in the world. Uh, something that's comically, ridiculously untrue. And yet Glenn Beck says it with such authority to scare people about Islam, particularly Muslim participation in the United States. Another example, Peter King, who's our incoming House Republican chairman of the uh, House Homeland Security Committee said on a, a radio broadcast recently that uh, Muslims are, um, uh, are not American. And uh, the quote was, this is very unusual in our country right now because despite a person's ethnic background or religious background, when a war begins, we're all Americans. But he said in this case, this is not the situation. And whether it's pressure, whether it's cultural tradition, whatever the fact is, the Muslim community does not cooperate anywhere near to the extent that it should. It's, it's these kinds of quotes that are scaring people about Muslim participation in the United States. It's that irrational fear uh, that's scaring them. And that irrational fear, of course, has played out in, amongst a number of communities, uh, LGBT community, the Latino American community, the Jewish American community, the African American community. These irrational fears have played out in a way that have served to scare a lot of people about the participation of those groups in American civic life, and we're seeing it again. And what happens, of course, is a de dehumanization of the other, uh, and it builds a wall, a caricature of a group, and it builds a wall that prevents you from knowing that other person, because all you know is that name, that face, means something scary, and it prevents a, a discourse from happening. And hopefully today what we're doing is trying to break through that wall a little bit. Uh, I thought since this Martin Luther King Junior holiday uh, this weekend, I'd go to uh, some Martin Luther King Jr. literature uh, as a starting point for our discussion. In his book, Strength to Love, Dr. King wrote, normal fear protects us, abnormal fear paralyzes us. Normal fear motivates us to improve our individual and collective welfare. Abnormal fear constantly poisons and distorts our inner lives. Our problem is not to get rid of fear, but rather to harness and master it. Uh, and I think that that's a, a pretty good place to start our conversations. Let me introduce our panelists. To my left is Fouad Pervez. Fouad uh, is a uh, PhD uh, candidate at Georgetown. He is an editor of uh, Foreign Policy and Focus, where he writes on uh, counterterrorism, foreign policy, and a whole host of other matters. Most importantly, this uh, panel today is his brainchild and we thank him for putting this together. Thanks, Fouad. Uh, next to him is Corey Saylor. Corey Saylor is the Legislative Director at the Council on American Islamic Relations, CARE. CARE is the leading Muslim civil rights organization in the United States and the most impactful. Uh, CARE has authored a report on Islamophobia, and I think Corey is going to talk a little bit about it, and we're thankful for his contributions. Next to him is Wajahat Ali. Wajahat is a playwright, journalist, attorney, a comedian, a general Renaissance man. Um, sure. He's written a critically acclaimed play called The Domestic Crusaders, which is one of the first major plays about the American Muslim experience uh, and has been performed across 
the country, including in Washington, D.C. last night at Bus Boys and Poets on 5th and K, for those of you who were there. I'm sure you enjoyed the experience. Thanks for being here, Wajad. And next to him, we've got our final participant, <laughs> Shahid Buttar. Shahid is the executive director of the Bill of Rights Defense Committee, which is an organization that seeks to uh, defend the rule of law and civil, li civil liberties in the context of uh, our counterterrorism policies. Shahid uh, previously was at the American Constitution Society and Muslim Advocates, uh, graduate of Stanford Law and attorney, and thank you for being here, Shahid. So let's get started. I'll start with you, Shahid. Uh, thanks for joining. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I, I saw uh, w w this week's news was Tucson, the tragedy in Tucson, devastating. Uh, and I think those of us who are brown-skinned and share Muslim uh, heritage, unfortunately actually blew a collective sigh of relief. I heard this from everybody across the board, that the first thing they did was they held their breath to see who it was. And uh, the guy's name was not a Muslim. It doesn't make the tragedy any less tragic. Uh, but for some of us, we know what would have happened had the person's name been Muslim. So I, I wanted to reference a quote by Peter Beinart. He wrote in the Daily Beast as a leading foreign policy thinker. He said, had the shooter's name been Abdul Muhammad, you'd be hearing the familiar drumbeat about the need for profiling and the pathologies of Islam. But since his name was Jared Lee Loeffner, he gets called, quote, mentally unstable. The word, quote, terrorist rarely comes up. When are we going to acknowledge that good old-fashioned white Americans are every bit as capable of killing civilians for a political cause as people with brown skin who pray to Allah? What's your reaction? Uh, two words, Timothy McVeigh, right? It was until very recently that we came to define in our collective consciousness terrorism in America as relating to American Muslims. That's a new phenomenon. Uh, and I think the double standard that is implicit in the reaction to last weekend's events is, is quite clear. You know, we, we sort of teeter perpetually on the brink of a constitutional precipice. You know, we are, we are one major terrorist attack away from an overt police state. We sort of have one now if you pay enough attention to notice it, right? So much of the government surveillance apparatus is secret that you, you, know, you might not even be aware from day to day that you know, your emails are being read by the NSA, that the FBI can get your financial and medical records without any judicial warrant, that you know, your activist group or your religious institution could have FBI agents in it, even if they don't even suspect that you've done anything wrong. And you know, this has been a very palpable reality for Muslim American communities, increasingly so over the last 10 years. And the phenomenon of the FBI's pervasive, I would even say ubiquitous presence in faith institutions particularly of Muslims, indicates to me essentially, and I hate to be, um, I thought about different ways to try to say this less brutally, but the fact of the matter is that the FBI is too busy chasing law-abiding Muslim Americans and peace activists. Folks might be familiar with the subpoenas of the now 20 peace activists across the Midwest who've been dragged before secret grand juries to testify to the government about what used to be constitutionally protected free speech and association. These are Palestine solidarity activists, Columbia solidarity activists. You take that community, you put the Muslim American community with it, and you see one particular noticeable gap, and that's, you know, crazy right-wing people in the South. If not, like Jared Lee Loeffner, then like Joseph Stack, right? The, and, and it's not as if being crazy has ever been a reason to discount something that is otherwise called terrorism by Muslims, right? There was a case in New York, the Newburgh Four case, where the FBI goes into a mosque, they pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to an informant who is an ex-convict himself uh, to bribe unsophisticated, vulnerable Muslims in this mosque into participating in a plot to bomb a synagogue. The four people who are ultimately indicted and currently serving counterterrorism sentences, if I have it right, include a heroin addict, a schizophrenic, uh, and then the other two were folks who'd been in and out of jail and, you know, quite frankly, had no aspirations, let alone capacity to plan anything like what they were over the course of a year and a half put up to by the FBI. You know, I can think of a, a kid in New York, Siraj Mateen, who was 19 years old at the time that they find him, developmentally disabled. This kid has the, you know, mental sophistication of a 10-year-old. He's brainwashed by an FBI agent over the course of a year and a half about the tenets of his faith, about events in the world, you know.